we have Dan Red again. Uh, Dan's currently the senior manager of Adobe Type and was previously type director at Monotype. He has more than 25 years of experience as a type designer, type educator, and graphic designer, and he makes the queer zine Pink Mints. And today he's going to talk to us about sexy things. So, Steve's talk was really good for providing some context for about a lot of the things that I want to get into, which is handy because I'm going to try to go fast. Um, I started looking at gay porn. Uh, in a research capacity, uh, <laughs> as, as nerdy people do, um, I looked at the letters. Um, this research that I've sort of fallen into started in kind of an innocuous way of just coming across an image of this uh, carefully cropped cover on Tumblr. Um, and I was amazed to see Franc uh, Francois Boltana's still a typeface in use, a typeface that I love and almost never see examples of because it's actually really tricky to work with. And I love that it got around the problem of the difficult L in this design by having this swooshing um, stroke that went underneath the D next to it, which definitely does not exist in the digital version of the typeface that exists today. So I went hunting around a little bit to see where that came from and discovered that, well, it's kind of obvious when you think about it. Bold was done in the era of more manual means of production for making magazines. And the Letraset version of Stilla, because Letraset was the original um, publisher of this, came with alternates for a number of the characters that made it easier for them to fit together. And it sort of made sense that the options that were available in these sort of analog days of the typographic production would have given possibilities that an art director with a little bit of training um, would have taken advantage of to get sort of a more elegant solution for Bold's headline than you might have guessed. Now, in addition to that, I also came across uh, an image of this cover of Drummer Magazine, which is sort of like a, a big publication in the fetish world. And I love this exuberant, um, all typographic cover, which is not something you associate with this kind of material, um, which you know is often lewd and photographic. Um, and for them to like take this kind of care spoke of a very particular sensibility that also came from how easy it was to come up with solutions like this when you were working with means of production, where you're laying things down letter by letter by hand. This is easier to do by hand than to say, do it on a computer in many ways, because you had some, you had a little bit more natural freedom when you're doing it manually. Um, so I started buying up more magazines, looking at more of the background of this, and trying to look at the typefaces that were in, in use that often uh, connected very, very clearly to sort of how things were produced during this sort of era, like the, the 60s spanning through the 80s. Um, the parallel story to what comes from looking at all of these older publications while I was looking at the typography is the social story that's going on. This overlaps with the era of gay liberation in the United States and the, the Western world in general. And if we look at the magazines of the time, we see transitions across this battle, not for just social acceptance, but fighting against the means of censorship that tried to keep that social acceptance at bay using legal means. Um, the Manichean Society was an organization uh, put together by um, homosexual men and women who were trying to, in a very, very respectful way, push their political cause forward. And the Manichean Review was a small newsletter, sort of digest size, put out um, by the society using these very inexpensive, fairly rapid means of production, because this is difficult material to publish, um, especially back in the 50s. Um, you see like typeset um, or sort of cheap headline typesetting, um, body text done with a typewriter. This is pre-Selectric, so it's still pretty rough stuff. Um, and then printed pretty cheaply. Um, and that was sort of the means of production that were available to people who were publishing from the underground, like Steve was talking about, and trying to make something look respectable with the limited means of production that they had. Um, the real commercial um, activity for gay audiences at the time were these very, very coded uh, magazines that were real, supposedly about like bodybuilding and fitness and health and 
uh, posing for sculptors and artists to use as reference. Um, to the communities they were pitched to, there was no denying uh, what these were for. And you see them in many other countries. It's not a US specific phenomenon. Um, and you see a lot of these sort of similar themes. And this connects to some of what Steve was talking about, like fairly uh, type coming from fairly inexpensive sources, not the best printing. Um, it's trying to, trying to make something that approaches the look of major commercial publications, um, but with, with the means at hand. Um, physique pictorial is a kind of a, a famous um, example of this in that uh, the photographer Bob Miser uh, published this over the course of years and years with barely any ability as a designer or a printer. He was primarily a photographer. I mean, he really was literally like, picking up guys at the bus station in Los Angeles and saying, it's like, oh, come stay at my house and we'll take some pictures and I'll make you a model. Um, and if you look at the way that his publications are put together, they're so raw, um, but in a way that I find really fascinating. I mean, this is kind of like this sort of punk rock typography in a way back in the 50s and 60s where you see exactly where he's taping things down to the photographs before sending boards off to printers to do it. Um, and this goes all the way through the inside where you see just the, this sort of urgent mix of handwriting and lettering and words cut out of specimen catalogs or possibly cheaply typeset when he could find someone willing to produce the material and all just thrown down as quickly and easily as possible. Um, but this aesthetic has a kind of appeal that I still find really, really charming um, because there's so much energy and life to it and particularly in a sphere of publishing that uh, the authorities were trying to like stamp down on as much as possible. Um, I have a collection of physique pictorial and I've got most of the run but I can't find the first three years worth of issues because they were seized by the police and destroyed and all of the, all of the stock that Miser had was ordered to be destroyed. Over the years though, as this sort of march towards acceptance moved forward, you did get these more major uh, newsstand publications. And you know, this may be the newsstand where you know, a lot of that cover is going to be covered by a little opaque bar on the newsstand, but sex sells. And once there was more and more sort of social acceptance that these things could exist, you get more and more publications that you know, threw a little bit more money at it because there was a bigger return on that investment. Um, this period of this sort of acceptance um, came hand in hand with movements in the United States to push back on the forces of censorship that tried to keep a lot of the publishing at bay. Um, uh, Eros Magazine very famously um, went all the way to the Supreme Court uh, in the 60s. Um, uh, so this was, uh, Ralph Ginsburg was the publisher, Eros was done by Herb Lou Ballin. This is like a really well-crafted magazine that had a you know, political and cultural stance that was really challenging to some people. Um, but even before Eros went to the Supreme Court, um, Herbert Lynn Womack went to the Supreme Court over, uh, over his publishing efforts, uh, particularly with Manual Magazine, which was another of these physique magazines that were often busted the way that Physique Pictorial was because you weren't allowed to send obscenity through the post. So using that mechanism of delivery and distribution, the government was able to crack down on material that was considered obscene. And the case around manual um, centered on this definition of what is obscene um, and the sort of subjectivity of that definition. Um, and Manuel went to the Supreme Court in 1962 and Herbert Lynn Womack and his publishing empire won that case. The Supreme Court said that the, there is some subjectivity to the notion of what is obscene and they should be allowed to continue publishing. And you see the difference between Manuel before that lawsuit and afterward where there's a much more directness in the gaze outward from the, from the magazine. Um, there's more, more overt objectification of the subjects with less of this discussion about health. Um, it's a little bit clearer what's going on. Um, Physique was another title that Womack published that went through a similar transformation um, pre and post uh, this, this, uh, uh, this court case that made it possible for it to be a little bit freer in the way it looked at the subject. Um, Physique pictorial, as I mentioned, had this rough quality as it carried through this, uh, this 
whole era that Miser published it. But Miser's sensibilities about how his, his handling of the typography and the means of publication stayed pretty raw. His interest was in the photography. His interest was reaching out to the community of subscribers. He sold his photographs as the side business to the magazine. The magazine was kind of a, a catalog for his photography industry, which was also itself kind of like a mask over the fact that he was often pimping out the models that he photographed. Um, and I can't really, in polite company, show you what the covers of Physique Pictorial were able to look like in the 80s, but I loved the urgency of him still just grabbing onto any means of typesetting that he could get, where you start seeing like, you know, Letraset Times Roman next to early bitmaps coming out of the Mac when that was possible in those days. Um, on the other flip side of things, the design and the publishing uh, still was getting better and better and better as it was more socially acceptable to do all of these. Um, Torso and Honcho were pretty big magazines and you could see that they're in the hands of art directors with a bit of proper design sensibility about what you could do. And they're sort of tasteful in their approach to both the imagery and the handling of text on there. And that continued to move forward. Um, when uh, Out Magazine launched in 1992, this is like a major moment to have a broadly commercial um, magazine for gay culture to be launched with people like Roger Black working on it. Um, at the same time that what was coming up out of the erotica side of the industry was still like inching its way forward and experimenting with like more trendy current uh, means of typography for the day. Um, I wouldn't say that Mach, for instance, was great typography, but I still see this movement forward and they're experimenting with like, you know, things, things getting a little bit more contemporary, at least in their choice of typefaces, even if the, um, the handling of it uh, is, is a little bit clumsy in terms of how it's being typeset, how it's laid out, compared to say the sophistication of something like Out, which had major financial backing in a way that, uh, you know, magazine of dirty stories was not going to have. Um, Physique Pictorial, interestingly, sometimes you just can't get around what's in those pictures. Physique Pictorial, interestingly, um, has remained sort of infamous and a point of inspiration for uh, photographers and publishers over the years um, and was recently relaunched by um, a foundation that uh, controls Bob Miser's estate um, and interestingly has come out as a fairly glossy magazine now. Uh, Physique Pictorial now comes out uh, for $30 an issue, beautifully printed, excellent mix of vintage and new photography. But I think this move towards a slick publication has really taken something away from the sort of rawness of those early issues where you have the sense of someone like so urgently trying to get the word out and make, make something um, by any means possible against all odds. Um, as I look at all of these, I talk about the means of production a lot because this became really, really interesting to me as I looked at more and more material. Um, what caught my interest early on and sort of kept coming through was that this dovetailing of social acceptance uh, starting to broaden um, Dove came together with the ability for type to be set more and more cheaply, more and more accessible to regular people who didn't have training, who didn't have service bureaus that they could go to. Um, and you start seeing all of these typefaces by Letraset um, rippling across the mastheads and the interiors of all these magazines. Um, and that's kind of a, a real boon for them because Letraset made beautiful typefaces. They were often crazy, but they were produced with great care because they were manufactured for the use of professionals. And it was a bit of a pivot in Letraset's understanding that it wouldn't necessarily be professionals who would be the ones going to art store to buy these sheets of rub down type and making things with it. So you look across um, some nutty typographic puns that happen like Letraset Frankfurter in use on hot dog. Um, and you see that the care of these typefaces comes through in unexpected ways. Um, as Steve said, these magazines bear all the signs of someone being able to get away with doing whatever they want on the covers of these magazines because no one cares about what's being put on top of the photos. So you see Roja Excafon show up on, uh, on Campfire um, because probably everything that they were 
selling the magazine with was happening below that crop point. Um, but yet, what an interesting sensibility to take this zesty French display typeface and, and slap it on there. Why not? Um, um, studs and leather, uh, again going for a bit of a visual pun, um, but really stuck in an almost arbitrary way, but taking this like well-crafted um, display typeface looking back towards the ninth century for something that was very contemporary for the moment. Um, and Letraset made good typefaces with the goal of making it easier for people to set text well. And Letraset Compacta was one of their top sellers, their first original design that really took off. Um, and it was designed to set really easily. It's very square, very vertical, so you didn't need a lot of skill to be able to space it and put together um, a block of headlines like this that held together so solidly. I mean, when you really zoom in on that, it's not the best typesetting. It was definitely done by hand. It's a little bit wobbly, but you know, having professionally made tools to allow an, an amateur or semi-pro to get something done was a pretty major development in our graphic culture overall. You see that Compacta was available in a number of sizes um, and a few variations as it grew in success to became the sort of workaday tool that you see all throughout the 60s and 70s, which are the era where Letraset really dominated the graphic industry. Um, and as I look closely at all of these, you know, when you get past the level of like the zany display typefaces up at the top, you also get into how things were put together at the lower level, you know. Um, that is not great typesetting of Optima. It's a little bit wobbly, spacing's a little bit weird, um, but I can, I can say, by the way, that things are put together, that this is either done with some degree of care with Letraset's version of Optima, or this was set pretty inexpensively by a commercial typesetter. Um, the interest about a lot of these headlines that have some saucy uh, content like this was interesting because it was, a, it was an ongoing problem that these magazines uh, would have trouble finding printers, finding typesetters, finding people who didn't have moral objection to the content to set it. And I was really happy when I was uh, showing some of this material at A-Type I uh, last year, and Carol's husband, Alan, pointed out that he remembers when t jobs like this would come through typesetting shops in the 70s, and you'd have a whole bunch of really, really normal copy, and then a couple of stray headlines specked in there innocuously, not really giving clues to what they would be used for or where else they might, they might be going. Um, but nevertheless, you see in some of the trickier things, like this bigger headline, or that sort of medium weight, you don't get an apostrophe like that unless you're doing something with Letraset and just laying it down by hand. Even, even like the cheapest commercial typesetter would have had to work a little bit harder to position something quite like that. Um, and this graphic language that uh, was put together for these magazines was not the most sophisticated, perhaps, in many places, but people identified with it. People still connected to the brands of these magazines. And in this example, I loved the fact that when the publisher changed the name of the magazine and relaunched it all together, he kind of just worked with the same layouts and the same title typefaces to not really reinvent the whole thing as he tried to reposition it, but just the graphics were like, it's okay, it's fine, it'll go. Um, this idea of the means of production becoming democratized, becoming cheaper and easier, taking things out of the realms of the professional so that someone who wanted to publish or produce something could do it themselves is really, really major. And I think this body of work is one of those areas that drove home the point for me that when you have the means of production, you have the ability to get your message out. Um, it's not just a matter of the economics, but just the ability of knowing that you don't have to be rely on other people when you need to say something that may be considered socially challenging. And this is not just something that's in the, um, the sphere of gay porn. You see these aesthetics that built up out of these semi-professional means of production in the hands of untrained designers coming through politics and punk rock and this is like a major, major thing 
that I think is very unique to where we got in the middle of the 20th century, where people could make things themselves. Um, they could get the word out with all of its urgency without having to let it get too tampered down by the other layers of commercial production. Um, and that's why you see in the magazines that Steve was showing and in other ones that it made it possible for you to put out these community newspapers, these political newspapers, these underground newspapers um, with untrained hands. They were able to get type that could be reproduced. Uh, with some degree of care, you could put together headlines, you could put together articles so that people could see what there was. Um, so the advocate, which is, you know, became a major newsstand magazine later on, started out as this weekly newspaper, you know, put together hurriedly with Letraset and Times New Roman and Microgramma. Um, Drummer itself started out as a community legal newspaper um, using a whole bunch of Letraset typefaces um, thrown together with the same kind of sense of urgency. Um, and Drummer is an interesting case study for me as an example of sort of how these things developed as became more and more appropriate to publish a lot of these things. Um, Drummer started out as this community newspaper that had the same kind of like fun, it's, it's practically like a, a specimen of Letraset typefaces. They're going for this punchy effect um, that had all of this variety of what you do because this jumped out. This drew people to it um, so that they would see, you know, get the, the messages that the publishers were trying to get out. Um, and when John Embry, the publisher of the newspaper, bought the name of Drummer to apply for his magazine once this newspaper folded, um, he seems to have kept on to some of the sensibility of like this typographically driven visual interest as a way of helping uh, pull people into the magazine and set it apart from just a regular skin mag. And the early issues of Drummer um, were art directed by a number of different people over the years. So I think it is the publisher Embry's sensibility in terms of saying this is the approach that the magazine is going to take. It may be raw in its content. It may be raw in its imagery, but it could be dressed up and made a little bit more sophisticated and a little bit more appealing through this kind of other angle of its typography. Um, and certainly in its earliest years, Drummer was really, really fun. This is, this is really inventive use of what people could do with Letraset, having access to a bunch of different typefaces um, and a bunch of, you know, what were the workaday means of production. Um, in the documentary Graphic Means, Steve actually talks about um, using this technique of statting images into harsh black and white and then overprinting over -printing with different colors of them to get these effects when you couldn't print photographically as such. And you see some of that come through. Drummer used a lot of illustration, which was unusual. And throughout, there's all this typography because it's a packed magazine. It wasn't really... Um, it wasn't so much a photo magazine, it was more about sort of stories and illustration and photography all coming together. Um, and the body text of the magazine is pretty straightforward photo typesetting, not without a lot of sophistication. So you see that the letter set typefaces that are mixed in and around are what are put in there for the punch. And this carried through to all of its other sort of you know, side brands that came out over the years, whether it be anthology magazines or when they began um, um, sponsoring events for the community, um, it created a very distinct aesthetic that was more about its typographic handling than the rather sort of extreme and characteristic imagery of its content. Um, and this naturally was going to also transition over the years with as the means of production changed. We talk about desktop publishing as being the great democratizer um, as well, and I think, I think in a way, desktop publishing introduced shifts into this aesthetic of what could be done because although more and more people could have access to doing layout and setting some type, there was also this distinct shift going from say the letter set era and the letter of all these photo type setting shops to the early days of desktop publishing where almost immediately you had fewer types, typefaces to work with. So there was a little bit more reliance on what you could do to like jazz up the text with color and different effects um, that, that 
conversely led to a little bit less sensitivity in the handling of the typeface itself. And now, so that ability to quickly get out a magazine where an art director may be able to apply sort of fun and a little bit of manual care in how the type was treated led to things like slap a typeface on there, get it to the printer. Um, and it's kind of a shame because this move towards doing things cheaper and faster eventually got past the point where you, early on you may have needed at least a bit of training or a bit of understanding about how things could get done in order to lay down some text by hand on an artboard. Suddenly, if you could type it on screen, you could put out a magazine relatively cheaply. Sometimes that had great results, sometimes not so much. Um, the outcome of all this research that I was doing uh, was an issue of this magazine, this little zine, I shouldn't say magazines, definitely not at that level, this little fanzine that I've been publishing uh, for the last two years. And I had wanted to really focus in on these uns unsung designers and art directors and typographers of the porn industry. Um, the folks who are just throwing headlines on top of photographs when it was assumed that no one really cared about what anything said, that it was all being driven by the imagery. But when you isolate it to just that typography and just the sort of zany and copywriting, they're kind of great all in their own way. Um, the interesting thing, which I didn't expect to find when I started this project, was if you try to exactly replicate the typography of these old magazines, you can figure out exactly how they were originally produced. Um, it is murder to duplicate letter set typesetting on a computer. Because um, first of all, you have to try to find typefaces produced in the analog era that are available digitally. Sometimes you can't find those alternates. I had to redraw that L to match the L from the letter set specimen because the version produced by um, Linotype today doesn't have that character. Um, but even with the nature of letter set being inherently manual, it meant that you have to like go in and kern every single letter pair to replicate the effect of laying down a letter one by one by hand. Um, and when there were slight, slight wobbles in the baseline and slight rotation to in the individual letters, that can be done, but it is not easy. Um, um, you can also tell when stuff was typeset with photo typesetting because there may be weird spacing, but it's very, very regular. Um, all of the weird word, word spaces will be the exact same width. All of the curious letter combinations are gonna be the same every time they show up. Um, and it's also easy to see when you have stuff that was used with early versions of um, Quark Express or PageMaker because the typefaces actually match how you could typeset them today. Um, you can see in this issue of, of Hard Up, that sort of weird but consistent word spacing that I was talking about is an artifact of photo typeset text that were got for these. Um, man's image, uh, although all of that avant-garde is uh, very, very like tightly packed, it's actually really consistent now it's put together. Whoever started with that um, must have done it um, in... Uh, uh, with PageMaker or Quark Express or something because the patterns of that space and of the relationships of the letters match what you were able to typeset today. Um, and it was interesting to go through this whole process and get this sort of historical investigation by accident out of just trying to show some cool typefaces in a weird context. Um, and it just seemed appropriate to close this all out on a note of levity of the one magazine that I've come across in a few years of gathering them that really capitalized on the erotic thrill of the printing press <laughs> and the hot, sweaty conditions of a, a press office and what that, could, what that could lead some studly working men to do with their free time in between jobs. Thank you.